You're listening to Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast, a clear voice in chaotic times. For the benefit of our guests, I'm pleased to introduce our president, Dr. Mark Bailey, as the chapel speaker today. Dr. Bailey came to DTS in 1985 as a professor in Bible exposition. And in 1997, he was appointed vice president for academic affairs and dean, or academic dean. And in 2001, he was named the fifth president of Dallas Seminary. Mark has been actively involved in pastoral ministry and theological education for over 25 years. He's conducted many tours to Israel and the Middle East and has had a part in authoring several books and articles. Dr. Bailey and his wife Barbara have two sons, Josh, who's married to Emily, and Jeremy, and they especially enjoy their two grandchildren. And I would like you to join with me in welcoming Dr. Mark Bailey as our chapel speaker today. I'd like to add my word of welcome to those of you who are our guests. We're delighted to have you on campus, and I look forward to spending some time with you after chapel uh, over lunch. Uh, some of you are aware, and I think it would be remiss of us if we as a community did not uh, pause for a word of prayer. Uh, there have been allegations that have been made toward uh, a Christian leader. There is uh, investigation going on. He is a high-profile pastor and leader in the evangelical world, uh, Pastor Ted Haggard, and uh, from Colorado Springs, and so all of that broke yesterday. And uh, our hearts grieve at the allegations. We will be even more disappointed uh, to find out if those allegations uh, prove true. But let's be praying for him, for his family, for the ministries, both at New Life Church in Colorado Springs, as well as his leadership position from which he has resigned uh, as the head of NAE. So would you join me in a word of uh, prayer as we uh, lift this situation to our Father? Uh, Father, our hearts are heavy when we think of uh, the fall, potential fall, the loss of ministry, the hurt in family and both the physical family as well as the body of Christ. All of us are tainted by even allegations of impropriety, and we ask especially for our brother that you would be working mightily in his life. For the church, that you would protect your work, for the ministry internationally, we ask that you would undertake. Father, in uh, the highly politicized atmosphere of politics, especially in Colorado and as well as around the nation, the kinds of uh, issues that are on the docket, we ask that you would uh, allow righteousness and justice to prevail, that truth would be known, that repentance would be demonstrated if necessary, and that you would humble all of us, knowing that it, were it not for grace, uh, we would not be where we are in the privilege of study and ministry. Lord, may this be a reminder afresh for us to walk closely and to keep our loyalty strong toward you and toward our families, toward our ministries. And we thank you that it doesn't have to be failure as the footnote of our life, but that we could live faithfully and walk into your presence and hear that commendation, well done, good and faithful servant. We pray that that would be true of us, and we pray that you would undertake in your grace, your wisdom, your holiness, and your truth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, what is heard is not always what was said. 
Why is the definition of a clean room different for a parent and a teenager? Why is the length of a Christmas list that will be being developed by children uh, of a different sort than their parents' Christmas list for that child? There's a story that has been told of Franklin Roosevelt, who often endured long receiving lines at the White House, and he complained that no one really paid any attention to what was said. And one day during the reception, he decided to try an experiment. To each person who passed down the line and shook his hand, he murmured, I murdered my grandmother this morning. The guests responded with phrases like, marvelous, keep up the good work. We're proud of you. God bless you, sir. It was not until the end of the line while greeting the ambassador from Bolivia that his words were actually heard. And nonplussed, the ambassador leaned over and whispered, I'm sure she had it coming. <laughs> Effective communication makes its demand upon the hearer as well as the speaker. What is heard is not always what was said. One of the most frustrating things for the pastor of a church or the teacher of any class, a preacher to any people, is the failure of the Word of God to take root and to produce better fruit in the heart and life of those listening. Bathed in prayer and prepared for the needs of individuals in mind, nothing is more disheartening than dis- or discouraging to watch the best pass of God's truth sail over the head of the intended receiver who runs an outside pattern rather than an inside pattern and ends up nowhere near the end zone of a fruitful Christian life. It might be the right time and the truth may be relevant, but at times there may be no result. The failure of result is in reality the result of a faulty response. Every time you listen, every time you open this book to study, every time you listen to your pastor or a teacher, there are some what we might call resistant dynamics at work in the room, in your heart. Every time you uh, speak, every time you teach, uh, whenever you preach, there are resistant dynamics in the audience that are going on. And I'm well aware that those resistant dynamics go on in chapel and classrooms at Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, You're thinking of more than school. You're uh, wondering about more than this hour. You're thinking uh, way beyond your next assignment. You may be wondering uh, what we'll do for the weekend. You may be, you know, am I going to watch the college games or am I going to read that reading assignment? All of that is always going on, and you're thinking about it even as I speak. In the mysteries of the kingdom that Jesus revealed as uh, evidenced especially with those that are found in Matthew 13, Mark chapter 4, and Luke chapter 8. The opening one is the key to the rest of them. If you have your Bibles open in Mark chapter 4, in verse 1, it says, He began to teach again by the sea, and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got in a boat in the sea and sat down, and the whole audience was on the sea, uh, by the sea, was on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching. I, I, this is a, a floating, uh, you know, beach party with a floating platform. I, I like the fact that the speaker got to sit and everybody else stood. Since I'm not the Lord, I'm not going to go there, okay? But uh, I sort of like the custom. He, he's seated in the boat. The natural amphitheater of the shoreline is up there. The crowds are gathered, and he begins to teach. And he begins to teach in uh, parables, which was a change for him. He had used proverbial statements, little pithy statements, like uh, you're probably going to say, physician, heal yourself. The blind lead the blind. There's a chance that both will fall in the ditch. Those kinds of pithy statements had been used, but uh, uh, full parables or similitudes, as we find in Matthew 13 and Mark 4 and Luke 8, uh, were a change of method for him, and they come on the heels. In fact, one of the gospel writers says, on that same day, and that same day refers back to the charge by Israel's leaders that he had a demon, to which Jesus responded, because they said he had a demon, according to Mark 3.30, they had committed the unpardonable sin. Ascribing to Satan the works of the Holy Spirit is wrought through the earthly ministry of Christ, brought a pivotal moment in the life of Christ where he begins to speak in biblical riddles, in what the Hebrews called mashalim, wisdom sayings. And when he starts speaking like that, at the end of this, they're going to say, why are you talking this way? To which he will say that 
the two major purposes for speaking this way is to reveal new truth to those who have receptive hearts and to conceal truth from those who have rejecting hearts. And with that as a background, he begins to teach that very familiar, you almost know it by heart. But I want you to see Mark says in verse 3, listen to this. We might title this, listen up. Listen to this. Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and they grew up and increased and yielded a crop producing 30, 60, and 100 fold. And he was saying, in case they missed it, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. The disciples then ask, why are you speaking this way? And after giving him the explanation, in part that I quoted to you, we have one of uh, three out of 50 parables interpreted for us by Christ. And this is the first of those. There is a continuing emphasis as it opens and closes that you and I need to be careful to keep listening. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. In the interpretation of the parable, I want to identify for you three reasons. Three reasons in those resistant dynamics why the word of God does not take better root or produce the desired level of fruit in some as opposed to some others with whom it is shared. The first explanation that Jesus gives us, that one of those resistant dynamics that's at work, probably every single time you and I encounter God's word, is what we might call satanic satanic interruption. Satanic interruption. This is the seed sown along the path. Look at it as he explains it in verse 13. He says, do you not understand this parable? (laughs) The disciples are probably going, no. Well, how then will you understand all of the parables? It's because this opening parable is the key to the rest of the parables, and that is, how will you hear will determine what you will understand. And how you understand will be determined on how accepting you are of God's truth and how you hear and accept, understand, and use God's word will determine the kind of fruitfulness that God will produce in your lives. It is a chain of reaction. It is a chain of effect. Satanic interruption, he explains, the sower sows the word. In Matthew's gospel, it's the word of the kingdom. Here it's the word. In Luke, it's the word of God. The the sower sows the word, and these are ones who are beside the road when the word is sown, and when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word that has been sown in them. You see, there's satanic interruption. 2 Corinthians 4 illustrates this when Paul says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. If you want a study, a sobering study, a sobering and timely study, track the tactics of the enemy through the New Testament. And tracking the tactics, watch what the New Testament says is the divine arsenal to resist those attacks. He comes to deceive and destroy. He comes as a liar, an accuser, a tempter, a blinder, a deceiver, a terrorizer, a sifter, an instigator, a misuser, an afflictor, a destroyer, a thwarter, and a murderer. Other than that, it's pretty quiet. But it's sobering, isn't it? That every time the word of God comes... There's an opportunity for the enemy to snatch that word lest it penetrate hearts. Luke records, lest they believe and are saved. Every time you share the gospel, it's not just culture, it's not just tradition, 
It's not just personality, it's not just training. You are in a cosmic battle between the God of the universe and the arch rival of his son. Will that change the way you prepare? It ought to change the way we pray. And before we walk in and assume a pulpit like this or a stand like yours or a desk or sitting across the living room, have you understood that Satan would like to mess that study up? Satan would like to destroy that ministry by keeping the word of God from taking root and ultimately hindering it bearing fruit. Satanic interruption. There's a second illustrated by the rocky soil. And in the Middle East, the wayside soil may be the roads around a field, but the chances are there's paths that cut right across some of these fields, and as those got trampled down by ox or by humans or by anything else, wagon wheels, etc., that sets you up for the first soil. But if you ever come with us to Israel, and God loves you, but we have a wonderful plan for your life. For those of you who are guests, it's Dallas Seminary. For those of you who are at Dallas Seminary, it includes a trip to Israel. But if you go to Israel, there was a, uh, uh, the rabbis had a statement that when the angels distributed the rocks, uh, the bags split over Israel, and Israel got the majority. It is one rocky country. And there are rocks everywhere, and the only direction to walk in Israel is up. Uh, if you're on a tour, it seems. Uh, but there, there are rocks, and especially with the different kinds of limestone, uh, the Cenomanian limestone and the Eocene chalk and the Cenomian limestone upthrust that you have geologically, it, it, it's very common to have a, a limestone shelf with just a little bit of topsoil that creates a false greenhouse effect. There, there's less moisture there. Uh, there is uh, more heat there. And so what happens when a seed falls on that, there is sort of a premature germination that seems like, whoa, this one's going to be a fast-growing plant, but it does not last. Look at the text with me in verse 16. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom the seed was sown on rocky places, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. And then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. One of the first resistant dynamics that goes on in a place like this or wherever we study or wherever we listen is satanic interruption, but the second we could call external opposition. External opposition. It's shallow, there's no root, it's temporary, it only lasts for a short time, and the reasons are because of tribulations and afflictions. Tribulations are allowed by God and probably take the form of circumstances most often. Afflictions are advanced by one's enemies, and that probably involves, for these who are listening, more criticism than uh, crushing blows. But in some parts of our world, we know that it obviously relates to physical affliction as well. Luke adds, uh, let's just put another one on the list, temptations. Temptations. Being led away and enticed to not do it God's way. Some of you are sitting here well know this one. When you made a stand for Jesus Christ, you took some flack for your faith. I've talked to enough of our students to know that for some, this was uh, the most foolish decision they thought, thought by the parents that you could make. To spend money and time to come to seminary. And the question is, what are you going to do for a real job when you're done? For some of you, it's a friend who uh, just didn't understand your response to the grace of God in faith. And they haven't figured that out yet. And Jesus is a realist to know, especially in the context of the first century, in a context of Judaism and uh, Roman persecution, as Mark is writing, you, that, that when one takes a stand for Christ and when one wants to see, receive the scriptures and, and, and be joyfully and enthusiastic, even if it's, uh, if it's too shallow of enthusiasm, that, uh, oh, you don't hold that, do you? Uh, you wouldn't believe that, will you? By extension, in academia, in academia, it happened to be just this last weekend, 
where somebody said, you, you really don't believe that, do you? It wasn't said to me personally. I had preached and had quoted Jesus' reference to Jonah in a message in Fellowship Bible Church in Northwest Arkansas, and one of the ladies that works in that church happens to be a secretary for a pastor of a mainline denomination in the community. She was going back and reporting the major points of the outline to him that I had preached on Sunday, and, and uh, he, he said, he, you know, the, the, the president of Dallas Seminary doesn't believe that Jonah is historical, does he? And my answer is, yeah, I do. Because Jesus did. Jesus said, the men of Nineveh will rise with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. I, I'm going to hang with Jesus on that one. I just think it's safer in the long run. <laughs> but that, 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 that persecution and affliction, and, and, and whether it's verbal or physical, uh, people are going to wonder, you're really not going to take and, 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 and apply that passage to your life in this setting, are you? You're not going to make that statement about what God thinks about divorce or what God thinks about you know, homosexuality or anything else. You're really not going to go there, are you? And the word of God that you've read or the word of God that you've heard You may say, yeah, and then when that comes, there's a temporary commitment and a temporary response. Now, you're going to love, you're going to want me to say, are these saved or unsaved? And I'm not going to tell you, because <laughs> I think the second parable in Matthew 13, the parable of the tares, tells you you don't know, so be careful, but that's another story. External opposition. The results, they're scandalized, literally. They're caused to stumble because of these tribulations, afflictions, or temptations, and they quickly fall away. And whether we know how to handle it soteriologically and eternally, most of us have seen it physically, visually, in all of our ministries. They came forward, made a decision. They prayed with you to receive Christ, and a year later, you can't find him. They're not living a life. You just don't understand. And you go, well, if they did this, how could they do This helps explain, even if it doesn't give you all the answers you would like. There's a third, and that's internal distractions. This is represented by the seed that falls among the thorns. And there are acanthus bushes in our culture and in some of the terminology of our own English language, and it comes from the word for thorns in Greek the acantha. Others are the ones on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones, verse 18, who have heard the word, but the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word because it becomes unfruitful. In the viticulture of Israel, the kinds of thorns, and you don't have to plant them, they just grow naturally in an uncultivated field, and sometimes you battle them in a cultivated field. But what happens subsurface is at the root level, the thorns wrap their, uh, their, 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 their roots around the good stock and choke out the life. Jesus loves to take natural illustrations from the culture and the viticulture of his day and use them as parallels for what God in his, is doing in his kingdom program. And he says this, worries of the world, deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes, as a result, unfruitful. Unfruitful. Do you catch those three? One is humanism, an overemphasis upon self. One is materialism, an overemphasis on security. One is hedonism, an overemphasis on satisfaction. Ken Hughes, in his messages that have been put in a book, in his first volume of his Mark series, says this. This is the divided heart, like the heart of a girl to which a young man once proposed. He said, darling, I want to know that, uh, I want you to know that I love you more than anything else in the world. I want you to marry me. I'm not rich. I don't have a yacht or a Rolls Royce like Johnny Brown, but I do love you with all of my heart. She thought for a minute and then replied, I love you with all of my heart, too. But tell me more about Johnny Brown. <laughs> Did you catch the distractions? 
These are the internal distractions. Satanic interruption, external opposition, internal distractions. Uh, worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches. And in case you didn't get found in those two, the desire for anything else. He caught us all, didn't he? It's deadly for the fruit producing process of God. Douglas Duar tells about the remarkable life history of a butterfly named the Maculena Arion. In the life cycle of this particular butterfly, the eggs are laid on a plant, and after feeding on the plant for several weeks, the young caterpillar makes its way to the ground. In order to complete its life cycle, it must meet a certain kind of an ant. If and when it meets such an ant, the ant strokes it with its antenna, and the caterpillar exudes a sweet fluid from a special gland on the tenth segment of the caterpillar. The ant likes the substance and carries the caterpillar home to its nest. And there the ants drink the sweet fluid exuded by the caterpillar. The caterpillar feasts on the larval ants. It winters in a special cavity in the ant's nest, and in the next season it continues eating young ants. And eventually it emerges as an adult butterfly and flies away to establish more of its kind. And the cycle starts all over again. It will be noticed in the case of this butterfly as in the case of humans, that the ants cherish a luxury item to the injury of themselves as a species. What will keep the word of God from taking root and bearing fruit in all of our lives is this stuff. It's these internal distractions that we think in our stupidity are a better definition of life than what God has designed for us. And I want to tell you that uh, you're not exempt at Dallas Seminary. Those of us who have been teaching for 25 or 30 years, or 50 years, or 40 years, have watched it generation after generation of students. And I would say that you and I are more susceptible to this now than ever before. We, we come to seminary not wanting to turn away are letting go of the good life as we thought we had it before we came to school. And the amount of hours that it takes to do the work here, the amount of study that it takes to discipline yourself, as Paul told Timothy, to give, your, uh, give yourselves wholly to these things, we still want what we had when we're taking on more than we've ever took, taken on before. And if we're not careful, we want it all. And all will keep us from hearing, will keep us from taking root, and bearing fruit with the Word of God. Jesus would say to us, listen up. I know you hear it because you have ears, but if you have ears, you need to hear it. David Redding says, recognizing the way Christians break the King of Kings down to a buck private says this, Christianity is fighting a losing battle in so many of our lives, not because we're bad, listen to this, but because we're too busy with our briefcase of second-rate stuff. We're too busy with the briefcase of second-rate stuff. The effect is unfruitfulness. Unfruitfulness. Well, there's a fourth soil, aren't you glad? And the whole purpose is to drive you to that fourth soil. It's the welcome reception. Well, not only are there resistant dynamics that are going on, but thank God there can be receptive dynamics that are going on. And there's three levels of fruitfulness indicated for those who hear the word of God and understand it. When you compare the synoptics, Matthew says here, understand, bears fruit, and brings forth six, 160 and 34. Mark uses the phrases hearing, accepting, and bearing fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Luke says they hear with a, an honest and a good heart and hold fast to it, and they bear fruit with perseverance. You and I cannot hear unless we listen. One writer said it this way, it's characteristic of the life of so many of us that we're so busy talking we have no time to hear, so engaged in arguing that we have no time to listen, so occupied in advancing our own opinion and our own views that we have no time to listen to the views of Jesus. 
so much on the move that we have no time for essential stillness. He goes on to say, Christianity fails to make an impact on so many people, not because they're hostile to it, but because they're indifferent toward it. And if we weren't, didn't find ourselves in the uh, first three, we may find ourselves excluded because of this from the last one. The whole point is that Jesus said, if you catch this, you'll catch the rest. And that is to hear, uh, to, to have a cultivated heart, to respond rightly to the will of God. To want to hear and want to do what God says. Let me give you three applications and we'll quickly close. Number one, I want to state a principle and then I want to give you an application. The responsibility for productivity in these passages is laid on the hearer or the reader of truth. You see, it's the same sower, it's the same seed, it's different soil conditions which represent different conditions of the heart. And so the responsibility for productivity is laid upon us. So my challenge to you and to me this morning is to uh, cultivate your heart. Cultivate your heart. Keep it from being crusted over. Keep it from being so packed down Uh, Keep it from being hardened. Have a cultivated heart as you come to listen and read, study, and devote yourself to the Scriptures. Second principle could be stated that productivity, therefore, is determined by receptivity. See, productivity is determined by receptivity. There's a need for a good and an honest heart to accept and understand. So obviously the application to us is be receptive to the will of God as found in the word of God. And my challenge for those of you who are contemplating Dallas Seminary, what is it that God has called you to be and to do? Where can you best get trained to do what he's called you to be and to do? And ask him for wisdom and the know how to do the will of God. But bathe yourself in this book through the process. Third, this is an important one for all of us, especially going into ministry. Fruitfulness may be abundant, but it will not necessarily be uniform. In fact, I could say it's stronger. Fruitfulness may be abundant, but it will not be uniform in everybody's life. See, it's good soil, don't miss this, that's good, honest, accepting, and understanding that bears fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Nothing wrong with the heart. But some people that, to whom you minister are going to grow faster than some other people. And for some, the fruitfulness will be more evident than it will be for other people. You dare not set the standard that if all are not 100 fold people, they are out of the will of God. Be careful. Faithfulness may be abundant, but it will not be uniform. Therefore, be patient. Be patient in your ministry to others. See, the success of the harvest depends on the quality of the soil. And Jesus said, you know, if you get this one, the other 49 parables aren't going to be a real problem to you. If you really want to know and you come with a good and honest heart and you accept it, there'll be understanding and you'll have ears that hear, and your life will be in a position to be used by God for the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of reproduction, the fruit of praise, the fruit of a godly life, all of the fruit passages of the New Testament can be yours. Would you pray with me, Father? Your son told us to listen up because not every time one listens does one hear. Forgive us for bringing our baggage to the text. Forgive us for missing what our pastors have wanted to say to us through your word. Forgive us for just attending a class or a seminar or just uh, out of a sense of duty and routine, opening your word just to log in some time so that we could say we did it. 
Deliver us from all of that, I pray. And that you would give us tender, receptive, waiting and willing hearts every time you speak. May that be our lifestyle so that you might be glorified in the fruit that you produce. Because your son told us that uh, abiding would result in producing much fruit. And in this, you, his heavenly father, and ours would be glorified. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.